Welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you are all with us this evening for our webinar, uh, Social, Emotional, and Academic Development in Math Classrooms, part one of our webinar series. Uh, we know that this is a really busy time for educators, um, so we just are happy that you've chosen to spend an hour with us this evening, and we're going to go ahead and get started. And we're going to actually start with a poll. Um, we'd love to know a little bit about who is in the webinar with us. And so if you would um, take a minute to let us know how many core advocate or educator webinars you have attended with student achievement partners in the past, uh, I will launch the poll. We'll take just a minute for everybody to answer. Great, so let me um, end the poll and show you the results. Um, so it looks like we have uh, most of you, about 66% are um, new to our Student Achievement Partners webinar. So welcome if this is your first one. We hope that you learn a lot and enjoy it and come back again um, to join one with us. And so we have a few people that have been to some webinars and even a couple of folks that have done more than 20 with us. So we've got some, uh, regulars, some Student Achievement Partner webinar fans with us. So thank you for being here. Um, we're glad that you are all with us this evening. I'm going to go ahead and um, just do some introduction uh, information for you, and then we'll get started. So um, if you find tonight's webinar helpful, we'd love to invite you to join our core advocate um, educator network. Uh, we are, as an organization, committed to solving real problems that educators, teachers, coaches, administrators um, have, and we know the best way to do this is by knowing more about what you all are experiencing. So um, we'd love to learn about who you are, where you work, um, the types of things you're interested in, and the expertise you have, so we can tailor our webinars and future professional learning opportunities to your needs and interests. So you can use the link um, achievethecore.org backslash CA dash sign up to uh, become a member of our network. And it's just a short survey that you can take to do that. Um, also, if you wanna learn more about us, I'm Jenny Beltramini and I'm a designer here at Student Achievement Partners. You're welcome to email me, um, also complete the survey um, or visit our website achievethecore.org to learn more about our work and what we do and what we have to offer. So uh, we are so fortunate to have a couple of educators doing most of the um, learning tonight on our webinar, as well as my colleague, Astrid Blossom, who's located um, in Wisconsin. Um, Bernice Wisniewski, sorry, Bernice, I like got your name, um, who works for Grand Rapids Public Schools, and then also uh, Tara Warren, who works in Santa Monica, Malibu in California. So they'll be introducing themselves to you all in just a little bit when they get started. Uh, we'd love for you to um, engage with us during the webinar this evening. So you can join the conversation about social, emotional, academic development in math classrooms on Twitter during the webinar or afterwards to continue the conversation. Um, we use the hashtag core advocates and you can also tweet at Achieve the Core and also Astrid and uh, Tara both have their uh, Twitter handles there so you can tweet them as well. If you have questions during the webinar, if you want to chat with us or with other participants, um, if you have resources to share, feel free to use the chat feature in Zoom. In the Zoom, we just value all your voices and um, would love for you to have conversation there. Um, and also, if you need help um, tonight with audio or anything technical or, or anything at all, actually, you can email, um, or sorry, private chat my colleague Jasmine Costello. Um, and then finally, you'll have access to the recording of the webinar. 
and the resources that are shared um, afterwards, they'll be emailed to you at the end of the program this evening, um, or maybe not until tomorrow morning. And um, they'll also be available on Achieve the Core. Um, a couple other things. We do offer a professional learning certificate um, for your time, for the one hour that you spend with us this evening. So at the end of the webinar, um, you will be given a link to a brief feedback survey, and those who complete the survey will be emailed the certificate for their one hour of professional learning. So you can have that to look forward to. And finally, we hope you know, um, but maybe you don't, that this is the first webinar in our social, emotional, and academic development and math classrooms learning series. Um, so at the end of the webinar this evening, um, we'll tell you more about how to be invited to join our community of practice meetings, which will be starting in October. Um, but you will um, need to watch either live or um, asynchronously both webinar one and webinar two to get that invitation. So um, tonight's webinar one, we hope you'll join us for webinar two. And then um, we'll tell you more about that at the end of the evening tonight. Um, and finally, before we get started, we want to share with you the goals of our webinar this evening. We hope that you'll come away understanding um, social, emotional, and academic development, um, which is a little different than SEL. It's a different acronym and involves a little bit something involves the academic portion. Um, you'll understand some connections between SEED and equitable practices in mathematics. And um, we're gonna share resources that will support um, students' social emotional needs while engaging in mathematics. So you'll walk away this evening with some of those resources that you can use in your settings. And I believe one of my colleagues has dropped, probably Jasmine has dropped the link to a resource sheet, um, a Google doc with resources in the chat, um, or you can use, I don't know if you can see the bit.ly, is the, is the, is the transcript over the top of the slides? For you all, no, okay. Great, so the bit.ly you can also use to get to that resource sheet, but the, some of those resources will be referenced tonight um, by our presenters. So you might wanna have that open and available. And with that, I'm gonna pass off to um, Bernice, who is gonna start us off this evening. Thank you, Jenny. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be a part of this learning community. I wanna thank you for your commitment to your students. You being here shows a lot at such a busy time. Today was my first day with students. It was so great to actually be in person. And that's, you know, the mic on, mic off, you know, trying to herd 25 kids, you know, seven-year-olds, you know, Natalie, put down that cat and pick up your whiteboard. I know you were there. And so um, the resilience in our students is incredible. It was just such a joy to have, have that back. Um, my name is Bernice Wisniewski. Um, I'm a second grade ESL teacher, Grand Rapids Public Schools, um, Grand Rapids, Michigan. We are an urban district and there's no place I would rather be than teaching there. I have to put that in, it's true. And now who's ready for a pop quiz? Um, before we begin the segment, take a brief moment to answer the following question in the poll. Um, rate your knowledge of, um, oh, it's right there. So you can read it and then you can start. Okay, so it looks like we have a range. Um, more are three, somewhat familiar. Um, we have some who are not familiar and a couple great who are extremely familiar. And so um, I'm hoping to give you an overview that will help you to um, make some connections. And let me close the poll so I can see the slide. So social, emotional and economic development seed is the latest buzzword in education. I know you've heard it, but what exactly does it mean? I'm going to give you a profile of a student that I had several years ago. Head down, hood over their head. If frustrated, making the most simple mistake, would cry, sulk, pout, withdraw from the class. Complain frequently of headaches and stomach aches, I know you've seen this, throw body down on the ground, scream and kick. 
Let me share you my past thinking about the student. The psychological framework I operated from with challenging behaviors like this was from a deficit perspective. This kid needed fixing. Attention seeking, not motivated, I would just go down the list. There is nothing wrong, of course, with me or my practice, right? Okay, I have to admit, being transparent, that I was there, but let's get forward. My practice evolved with my involvement with SEED. It is a journey that I'm still on, I will be honest with you. What I learned is kids do well if they can. I first assume now that stu the student is already motivated, already knows right from wrong, and as we know, has already been punished enough. I do not have to fix students. I have to change the environment so all students can be successful. I have to figure out what skills, and you can see down here this shift, what skills are lacking, so I have a clear understanding of what is getting, what is it that's getting in their way? Now, this is absolutely a shift toward creating an equitable learning environment, not controlling students, but holistically supporting their development and learning. It's more that asset perspective, not like, I like Homer, let's see, quick fix, quick fix. <laughs> Wish I could do that, but no, it is developing and it's an, it's an investment that is well worth your time and effort. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as Castle states in Castle, if you're not familiar with it, with the organization, it's where I get most of my um, learning with um, social emotional academic development. It stands for collaboration for academic social and emotional learning. It's a great nonprofit organization and in your resources, you're, you're going to get um, links to them. Get on their mailing list. You get so much great information. So as Castle states, lean on the science. The research documenting the impact of SEL is compelling. This, we have two decades of research um, it demonstrates that education promoting social and emotional learning, SEL, it gets results. The findings come from multiple fields, not just education, um, student achievement, neuroscience, health, employment, psychological classroom management, learning theory, economics, and of course, the prevention of youth problem behaviors. But from my own experiences, I have personally witnessed the culture of my classroom evolve into a, a caring, inclusive environment from cultivating seed into my everyday practice. Just look at the data. Um, of course, we want the academic achievement, but if you look at the improved bathroom, oh my gosh, I almost said bathroom behavior, sorry about that. <laughs> improved classroom behavior, um, self-regulation, um, managing stress, um, depression, that ad attitude about your, yourself, children thinking about themselves and others, that frees, up, that frees up their minds to concentrate on academics and to have that agency for success. I, I cannot think of a better thing to give to our students. Thank you. Now, um, the benefits of SEL, they do go beyond individual students or even just challenging behaviors. On the previous slide, this also comes from Castle. If you look at the up, that was on there. But if you look at the down arrow, fewer conduct problems, less emotional stress, lower drug use. So it's moving students from trauma to resilience. And these skills will be with them for a lifetime and make students more employable, um, give them that hope and that focus. And the research that's coming out about what trauma does to, you know, the effects, the long-term effects, this is such a way to, as I said, drive our students toward resilience. And of course, adults benefit too. I love this and I've seen this. 
I've seen this in myself too. Um, teachers who possess social and emotional competencies are more likely to stay in the classroom longer because they're able to work more effectively with challenging students. One of the main causes of what? Burnout, that's right. To stay in our classrooms to be healthy, we have to create that healthy classroom environment so all benefit. You're not taking home the stress because you have these tools to help students which help, help yourselves and the culture of your classroom, the culture of the school, it, it's, I've seen it, it's just, it, it frees you and it frees you to enjoy your profession, have fun and learn while you're helping students. And of course, it's a lifelong, it's a lifelong pursuit. So now our connections um, with CASEL. What is the connection between SEL and academic learning? I want you to listen to, um, Castle's call to action. We must challenge the status quo, call attention to systemic inequality and commit to equity in all community learning spaces. In other words, we must bring an equity lens with us wherever we go. All youth, no matter their race, income and community resources should be given the tools they need to create their best lives and embrace a bright future. Seed is a tool that can benefit students for a lifetime. Research is crystal clear. We've seen the research, two decades of research, that the social and emotional aspects of classroom and school culture greatly impact students' academic performance. Yet efforts to introduce SEL generally take place outside of students' core subject classrooms and tend to focus on students' attitudes, skills, and behavior rather than the effect adults in the school have on creating a context that nurtures students' social emotional growth. We owe it to our students. This is research-based and it's a call to action. It's not something that's added, something to do on the side or pull out students. If it's embedded, into the culture, the results are um, phenomenal. They're changing. Um, so that is one call to action. And we have another call to action. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is um, from a, a nation at hope.org. And I really appreciate um, their movement and what they have been um, doing um, to respond to the demand. Um, and it's true, our nation is at a turning point. We know that in so many ways, and now is the time. Now is the time. We understand that social emotional development underpin children's academic learning growth and success. Um, this understanding is fueling, th th there's a growing movement of young people, educators, parents, researchers, leaders in business, civil rights and communities from across the country. Science has made clear that children learn best when we teach them as whole people. And schools, communities are recognizing that they can no longer separate academics and students' broader development. Skills and knowledge is great, but identity, criticality, and just developing that whole student is what we need to do so we can make that trajectory go up instead of how it's been level for decades. Next slide, please. Oh, it is. <laughs> new lenses and a new tool. Um, again, it's the, the lens is the equity lens. As schools reopen this year, educators, we all want to support students, both academically and socially emotionally. Students have been out of the building since March 2020. Think of the losses that they, that they have experienced, their sense of belonging, um, not, you know, at school with their friends, all the social supports, church, um, youth groups, just gone. Perhaps their identity as a student, as a learner, 
and for many, the ability to discuss academics and groups that discourse. Um, I'm an ESL teacher, one of the main things, turn and talk, talk with your partner. So, so many kids have been isolated during this time. And the ability to make choices about their learning interests, that agency. To be honest, when I reflect upon um, my classes pre-pandemic, equity and participation may not have been present when I did not explicitly embed SEL practices into my lessons. I had to, when I would put that thought into how to make it equitable so all could enter the learning, it, it, it didn't happen. So I love, uh, you have probably seen this um, down below, um, this equality, equity, and empowerment. Um, I'm going to read above. It says, teachers do not teach content in SEL. They use SEL to teach content, which provides a more open, inclusive, and affirming experience for students. The first time I saw this diagram, it was just the two um, pictures. I didn't see the third one. And of course, with the equality, being equal, giving each student the same thing. And of course, you can see the marginalized, the disadvantaged, and the, you know, at the top, equity, giving students what they need. I look at SEL and SEED being that empowerment. We are empowering our students and our students deserve this. The barrier is gone. And, and, and so when I saw this um, added, I said, I have to put this in because this really, to me, is it, it, it shows, demonstrates the empowerment of SEED with our students. Um, so now we as educators, we have a powerful tool and it's research-based to drive resilience as well as academic growth. SEED is my pathway for creating an equitable learning environment. And I hope that if you, if you don't have it embedded that you will um, join me on this journey because it is a learning journey. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, you get into it and you um, learn the practices and embed and all of a sudden you see progress. And I guarantee you will research and figure out more ways of doing it. And I even learned a new tool, which um, my friend Tara is going to um, connect you to. Thank you. Um, good evening, um, everyone. For some of us, it's like a late afternoon, um, but good evening. And um, I am super pumped that you guys are here with me. I am still in my classroom. You can see behind me. Um, I am a middle school teacher in Santa Monica Unified School District. I teach seventh grade and eighth grade. I teach seventh grade core and um, algebra to seventh and eighth graders. And so part of what we're going to talk about today deals with SEO and SEED and equitable practices. So I have a question for you guys to think about for a poll. On a scale of one to five, how closely do you connect SEO, like the, the idea of SEO, how do you connect that to equitable instructional practices? All right, we have a good number of coming in. So we're gonna stop the poll there. And um, what I just wanna just look at the, the poll results and see that we have made some, some connection and fair connections kind of in general. Um, but we, to be quite honest, prior to COVID, would we have made these strong connections um, with SEL and equitable instructional practices. I don't know that I would have. And so just really thinking about SEL was at the forefront of our mind. And we now have to think about how, did, how does this play into these equitable practices and what is it that we can do to move us forward? So as we begin today, we're gonna to talk about how this is gonna move us forward. And as we go through this section, I want us to think about how we're gonna answer this question. How are the SEED themes, are the SEAD, again, social, emotional, and um, 
social, emotional, academic development. So how are these themes connected to equity? And we'll connect those two as we go through this next section. All right, next slide, please. I don't see, are we on the next slide? I don't think so. So the next slide is gonna show us or talk to us about Principles to Action. This is a book that was published in 2014 um, from NCTM. Um, Bernice, can we see the next slide or, or what are we looking at here? Um, no, I'm sorry. No, we're still on the past slide. Yeah, I just pinged Jenny. Um, I don't know if she's having difficulty. Hopefully she can move it okay. or give access so someone else can show their screen. All right, so I'll keep going because the next screen, I'll read to you what is there. This is an excerpt from the principles to action. And then we're gonna have some, a reflection to what I'm gonna um, read to you. And so on that slide, we quoted from our principles to action, which was again, published in 2014 by NCTM. And what it says is that teachers' beliefs influence the, the decision that they make about the manner in which they teach mathematics, right? So we understand that our beliefs influence the decision that they make about the manner in which they teach mathematics. Students' beliefs influence their perception of what it means to learn mathematics and their dispositions toward the subject. The impact of these beliefs on the teaching and learning, there we go, we got it. So the impact of these beliefs on the teaching and learning of mathematics may be unproductive or productive, right? So they, they could be either of the two. It's important to note that these beliefs should not be viewed as good or bad. Instead, beliefs should be understood as unproductive when they hinder the implementation of effective instructional practice or limit student access to important mathematics, con mathematics content and practices. And so this understanding is fueling a growing movement of young people, educators, parents, researchers, leaders, um, and even um, leaders in business and civil rights and communities from across the country. So this is making a big influence. Like this is something we know that is influencing how we think about education. And the science has made it clear that children learn best when we teach them as a whole, as whole people. Like we look at them as students, um, as people, not just as what's in front of us for academics. Schools and communities are recognizing that they can no longer just separate academics and students broader development. And so this is where it comes into play. This is where the rubber meets the road. And so my question to you, just to do a, a quick reflection for about a minute, um, what are some beliefs you hold close to your heart in your teaching practice? So I'm just gonna give you a chance to think about that. Um, if you wanna jot it down or some, somewhere, what are the beliefs you hold close in, to your heart? All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So here's um, some research that was done by the opportunity, uh, research done by TNTP. So you can find it on tntp.org, um, but it's called the opportunity myth. That's the, what the study is called. And so this study looked at thousands of educators and students and just went through um, this really extensive interview process to find out some information around um, equitable practices and belief systems and what's happening in our classrooms. And so this slide really talks, uh, speaks about that there are four key resources that benefit all students, right? When we have students come in front of us, we wanna benefit everyone. We don't wanna just parse out like, this is just for these kids and this is just for these kids. Like we wanna benefit all students and here are the four key resources that benefit all students. In the graph that we're looking at, we're looking at the top quartile and how they scored with the bottom quartile and these four key resources and what has the biggest benefit. And what, this was eye-opening to me when I first saw this because the thing that makes the biggest uh, makes the biggest gains for our students is the expectations that we put in front of our children, right? So think about those students that in your heart, maybe you didn't feel like they could do it, but you had an expectation for them. Setting that expectation for students is the biggest benefit for all students. And this is looking at the top quartile versus the bottom quartile. So that's a 4.6 months 
that they can gain just simply by the expectations you put in front of them. All right, so let's look at the next piece. So there's another piece of this as well, where this one is looking at the top half um, of the group versus the bottom half of the group. And this is saying, these students in the bottom half are substantially lower, but again, those four benefits are in play and the expectations far outweigh the benefits of the other three benefits we have in front of us. And so again, for me, that was jarring. If you just think about the times where you've had a teacher to say to you, you can do it. You can be an author. You should write a book and how that made you feel. And I'm pretty sure we could have story after story in this room, in this space, where teachers are saying, I was able to do it because so-and-so said I could, right? I was able to do it because the expectation there was for me that I was able to do this. And so we know that those expectations are there and that's, a equitable, that's something that's an equitable practice that we have to think about when we think about what we put in front of our students. And so um, SSEED and as well as CASEL, they started the work, NCTM started the work, work with um, what the academics can look like. So CASEL and SEED are coming together and they're thinking about how does this come into play when we're thinking about our whole student? So let's think, so on the next slide, we're thinking about SEED and it's bridging the work and making these connections between what we're talking about with NCTM and the academics, math academics and equitable practices and how CASEL has built in um, what the SEL things that we need to put in place and we're bridging those together. We're looking at the whole child and not just part of the child and just being really thoughtful around what is what are we putting in front of our students to grow them, not as just mathematicians, but growing them also as whole people. We want them to leave from us, not just knowing how to be a calculator. We want them to leave from us knowing that they are loved, that they know how to do math, that we believe in them. Because again, if we go back to those four benefits, the expectation makes the biggest, is the biggest benefit for our students. So let's look at the themes. There's four themes that we're gonna look at that SEED really puts in play. And so we're gonna look at those four themes. We have agency, we have belonging, we have identity, and we have discourse. And so this, this visual over to the side probably looks familiar to a lot of people that have done some PD with math over the last 10 years. This comes from a book called Adding It Up. And it talks, it's just kind of like the, the framework of where the new standards and the mathematical practices, like where all of that stuff stemmed from, like it came from like this rope of like, all of these things need to be in play in order for us to be able to build standards and mathematical practices that matter for our students and for our teachers. And so we have all of these five components, but today we're really talking about that productive disposition. And that's, that's what circled here. That's okay. <laughs> we're talking about the productive disposition. All right, now we can go to the next slide. So we're just really gonna take a look at each of these themes um, and just take a look at what they mean. And then maybe I'll give one example of how that theme comes into play in the classroom. Because again, I wanna make sure I'm really clear that we're talking about um, this work as an equitable practice and not just the work to be done that's good for all students. This is something that we're like, we need to make this, make all of, um, this work matter because it's good as an equitable practice, not just because it's good for kids in general. So if we first talk about identity, when we think about identity, um, NCTM has defined it with these two characters. Identity um, from NT NCTM is the dispositions and beliefs that students develop about their ability to participate and to perform. So we're thinking very academic. It's also saying that students use mathematics in various contexts, right? And so we're familiar with that. But then when we bridge that into what CASEL has put in play, it also includes understanding the links between personal and social cultural identities. So not just thinking about the math that students can do, but how does this play a part in the personal and social cultural identities that they hold? and it grounds in and affirms their cultural heritage and community. So what does that mean for our students? How do we get those things in play when we think about the students that are in front of us in our classroom? So 
as an equitable practice, think about we want our stu students to see themselves as mathematicians, as well as see themselves in the math. We want them to engage in the math and see that this is important because I'm gonna use this at some point. So maybe you know that your students um, help cook at home. So they're in their families, they are, cooks, they cook in their family, it's a, it's a big thing, we all do it together, hence the picture of the family that cooks together. So they're cooking together, um, but, but what we also know is that that's just one piece of that family. But when we take it a step further, it's not just knowing that they cook with their family, but understanding that there's a major um, weekly event that they serve. And so those are places where, oh, so if they have a weekly event where they serve, are they having to scale recipes to be able to help their parents and make these larger meals? Can I use that when I do scale factors? Because now I'm looking at something that they hold close to their hearts. That's something I hold close to my heart with my family. We cook together, let's measure it out. Let's do it together. If it's a pinch, now we need two pinches, right? And so that's one way we can bring that identity into the classroom, thinking of not just academics, but also bringing in that social emotional piece as well. So that first piece is identity that we're talking about. Um, the second piece that we're talking about is discourse. And it's more than just talking in the classroom. It's more than just turn and talk to your friend. Think about those students in your class when you say turn and talk to your neighbor. Some of them will never turn and talk. I'm not turning and I'm not talking, right? And so it's more than just turning and talking. It really looks at, so thinking of what, how we bridge this together with NCTM, um, ways of representing, thinking, talking, agreeing, and disagreeing. Um, it's shaped by task students are, that students are engaging. So that's the academic piece. When we bring in the piece that brings in that social emotional, it's encouraging academic talk, increasing the student talk time, and then create opportunities for students to understand viewpoints of others. Um, what we really want to make sure that we're clear about is that there's some strong connections to our standards of mathematical practices. And so when you hear, if you're really abreast around, like I teach math, I'm thinking about those practices and that's playing a hit in my head. All of these are steeped in mathematical practices. Identity has them all. It could touch in all of them. This one really touches on one, three, and six. But again, what does that look like when we talk about equitable instruction? When we're talking about equitable instruction, it could be engaging in a three read right? So a three reads task where students must communicate effectively with one another to complete shared work. I'll share a very brief story um, over online distance learning. I was like, I can't get these, my students to talk to each other. No one's saying anything. I can't get them to interact. I used three reads. I was very strategic, but I was like, I'm going to get you to talk. You have to talk to someone to get your answer. So using three reads to be able to help that discourse. We're helping them with discourse, but think about when they leave your classroom, when they leave high school, they're gonna have to work in teams. They're gonna have to work with others. Why not give them the caveat to be able to talk about it in the classroom practice before they leave? They can practice that in the room. The next one is agency. And so what does that look like? When we talk about NCTM, it's identity to oneself and others. It's about who we are. It's about what we do. And there's a strong connection between SMP1 there. But what does it mean when we talk about social emotional? It's the cultural competence. It's the cultural fluency. And so the visual here, you can see that these are the things we see of our students. These are the things that we understand about our students, but there's so much more that's underwater. There's so much, there's so many more levels. They're so much more deep than we think they are. And so thinking about the equitable instruction, it's drawing on students' funds of knowledge, right? So when we're presenting broader concepts such as statistical data, which tells the story of say student habits and grade distribution as a way to think about what's the most efficient way to study. So students are like, man, I, I don't, this class is hard. What did you study? So let's talk about what's our grades in this class. And then let's talk about who's studying in this class. And let's look at the distribution and bringing that all into play. And then they're like, oh, maybe I should study more if I wanna get a better grade. That's like a direct correlation. Oh, I used another word, a correlation, right? And so really thinking about the math has to 
be part of what they're doing. It has to be part of what they find important. And so agency, who we are, what we do, and those cultural fluencies of, I study every day with my sister at the table, let's have a conversation about it. All right, and so then the last one we'll speak about is belonging. This one re really reaches to like um, just the thought behind, all students wanna be a part of a group. Every, every middle school student that comes into my class, they wanna be a part of some group in this class. Whether I say, are you a part of your small group at your table? Are you, are, do you play basketball outside? They wanna fit in. So that belonging piece of, I am a mathematician in this room. We are all part of this group of mathematicians and bringing into play, examining what it means to belong in a group. If you are a mathematician, what does that look like? Engaging in initiatives and students engage in those initiatives and co-create solutions that allow them to bring in that belonging of being part of that group. So not just giving a solution of this is how it's gonna be fixed. No, if you are wanting to be a mathematician, here's some ways to become a better mathematician. So thinking about equitable instruction, making sure all students see themselves as growing mathematicians, um, just making, giving them sufficient knowledge of mathematics to use to provide solutions to problems in a useful way. Um, but knowing that mathematician is a profession, we wanna say, how can we be a mathematician as a student? Let's put you in a driver's seat. Let's set some mathematician goals for you. So as a seventh grade mathematician, what are the goals that you wanna have when you leave here? How can we grow you as a mathematician as you're here? And they have now, they have agency and now they feel like they belong because they're part of a group of mathematicians that are part of seventh grade group. Does that make sense? So really thinking about those four places and equitable instruction, we are bringing everybody into the table, making sure everybody feels a part of it, using these four themes, agency, discourse, um, identity, and belonging. Like we're, th these are the four links that's gonna allow us to not just look at mathematics as this is a discipline and instruction, but looking at it as, I have mathematicians in my classroom that I need to build in some things that's gonna not just bring out them as mathematicians, but they also need to know they belong here. They need to know that I care where they are when they leave my room and what they're learning and bringing that into the classroom for those students as well. Yeah, I'm gonna try my best with the advancing slides and talking at the same time. Um, I'm Astrid Fossum. I am also a designer at Student Achievement Partners like Jenny. Um, I hail from the beautiful shores of Lake Michigan and Milwaukee, which is the traditional homeland of the Potawatomi, the Ho-Chunk, and the Menominee. Um, and I am experiencing a little rain as well here in this great land that I'm in. Um, for this last section, you know, I really want to thank Bernice and Tara for um, laying some of the foundation, not only on the research, but also like these ideas about equitable instruction. And we were trying to solve around a problem of like, there are just so many stories we're hearing right now where schools um, have lots of, and districts have lots of initiatives around SEL. Um, and they aren't super connected to what's happening in the classroom. So like that, really that research and then seeing that bridge between what NCF, NCTM has put together and what CASEL is really thinking about is let's change the acronym, right? Let's change it to SEED, Social, Emotional and Academic Development. And we started an investigation of like, what are resources that would actually help with this when we think about um, mathematics learning? I was a teacher for 10 years and worked in the district office here in Milwaukee for many years um, once I was out of the classroom. And, um, you know, it's really, I think, really important to think about what's actually happening. And I know that I have probably myself been guilty of saying things like, I teach math. Um, and I don't want that to be the language that I, you know, fall back on. Um, so really thinking about what kind of resources we have out there that can really help so that I, that is language that I no longer use, that I think about the whole child that's coming to me in my classroom 
is really important. And that kind of was part of our search. And one of the resources we found was from equitablemath.org. Um, this, this resource, I'm gonna get into it a little bit, actually comes from a conglomerate of a lot of nonprofits that are really focusing on mathematics specifically um, and equity. And that can be these nonprofits, but also like districts, county offices. Um, I believe Tara mentioned earlier um, TNTP with the opportunity myths that that's the new teacher project they're involved in um, getting this uh, math toolkit is the way I just kind of reference it all the time out as well as like TOTOS, Unbounded, um, the LA County Office of Education is involved in this, um, just equations. So a lot of math um, research work, a lot of good minds coming together to really put this toolkit together. One of the things you might notice on this first slide though, is that it says to thrive in grades six through eight. So it was important for us to test that grade band. And we've found that um, while, while many of the examples in the toolkit might be from middle grades, that shouldn't be anything that stops anyone from going in to investigate and see what's actually in here. Bernice used the lesson planning tool that we're gonna um, lightly share today and then bring back next month in her second grade classroom. And we'll hear from other educators next month that are in different grades as well that use this in, um, in their classes too. For those of you that have that are more familiar with Student Achievement Partners or SAP, you might be familiar with um, our learning series on dismantling racism in mathematics. Um, that comes from Stride One, and you'll notice that Stride Three is the one creating conditions to thrive. That's actually where we found a lot of the information and research and the lesson planning template um, that really supports academic development as well as social and emotional um, support for students. But I also just want to say we didn't like intentionally skip stride two. Um, it's it it really is more about um, stride two deepening students conceptual understanding, which is from that thread um, from adding it up. But it's just the timing of the year, um, all of the interrupted schooling that's that kids and teachers have had. It, that really just elevated stride three for us. So we didn't feel like this had to be completely linear. Um, just with the onset of the new year and thinking about really creating a safe and supporting learning environment for students, especially those that, that have faced so many challenges recently and for all of our students that we know are just currently and historically marginalized, it really felt like we needed to um, elevate stride three at this time. So within stride three, um, there are, it, you know, kind of this subtext here of environments and practices that support student social, emotional, and academic development, um, I would say is, is the main focus of this. Um, what we do know and what we're seeing here is that there needs to be a balance. Like, I love that bridge. I keep thinking about, like, the equation balance here, um, that we have social and emotional support that we're attending to as educators, and we have academics that we're attending to as educators. Uh, we know that tough love and rigid academics are not the answer. We also know that um, supporting students' mental health and not providing them access to grade level content and lagging mathematics isn't the answer either. Um, which of course now sets us into this tricky place because it can't be even every single day, but over time it needs to be. And we do have to be responsive to students. So really thinking about how um, this question on the side, what actions can I take as a math teacher to support students' social, emotional, and academic development like within my content area? Um, and this equity toolkit in particular, Stride 3 has really been a super bright North Star for us. Um, what's included in this, there are themes. So the um, 
English Language Success Forum is also one of the partners. I don't think I mentioned them earlier, but there are particular things that support um, our students that are learning English. So there are scaffolds included in there. Um, the four themes that Tara mentioned, identity, agency, belonging, and the really rich discourse are included in the toolkit as well. Um, there are suggested actions and strategies. Now, many of them will be examples from 6-8, but they aren't completely limited to that. Um, and we're hoping that we're going to get more examples of other grade levels. So we'll talk about that in a minute too. And then there are particular guidebooks that really pull apart each of the themes that Tara said. So there's, it's really all encompassing. There is just so much in there. Um, and it's, it's worth the read. It isn't something that you have to like start on page one and go through the end, but you know, you can kind of go through um, the whole guidebook and see what's there, what works for you, because we all know that um, all classrooms and all situations are really different that way. There is a connection to, to the, um, some examples in the priority instructional content, which is something on your resource page that um, do have examples for high school, if you follow that link and some, high, and some examples for K-5. This is a really quick overview tonight. Um, but one of the other really fantastic things that's included that I had just mentioned was the lesson planning template. And, you know, for those of us that have been around forever, it's like, oh, another template, another way to lesson plan. Really, you're asking me to write a full on four page lesson plan a couple of times, right? Like as Bernice and Tara and Karina and Nathan, who are working with us too, who will share their stories next month, um, were saying they really um, going through the lesson plan just a couple of times, it helped them get in the mindset of how I might continue to plan without lose, using having to use the lesson every single time. As coaches, as administrators, it's worth a look because there are questions that you could ask um, novice teachers, teachers that are really working on ways to make those connections between SEL on a daily basis and the academic content that they're teaching. So you'll notice throughout this lesson plan, these seven components, we've actually teased this into like a maybe more user-friendly um, template that we're gonna share next month. And we have linked in some of the blog posts in the series that um, are linked on the resource page as well. One of the quotes that I think is really important when we think about all of this too, is that this isn't, you know, I think about equity, I think about SEL, I think about all of these programs that are in place. And it isn't about having students do things one way or the school way um, and following these rules and getting tokens and having them purely like assimilate to school culture. I mean, sure, there are things that kids need to know, but what's really nice about this is it, that it isn't super rigid and it doesn't force one approach on all learners. Um, rather the content and the support that the students need with the teachers in the classroom on that day are kind of the, are the guide and it can be tailored to fit students' needs. Um, one thing I've been impressed with is that the whole child and their learning is really being considered here. Um, this stride and what is included is not, as I said, about like doing school one way, um, it's about affirming them. It's about accepting students the way they come in, really thinking about asset-based language and um, building and supporting students as learners and doers of mathematics. And so, you know, as you walk away today, really reflect on some of the ways you might be able to shift your math practice to use SEL daily in your math classroom. I don't think I'm calling anybody out in sharing a story about my nephew who last year in um, virtual learning had SEL for the first 30 minutes as an eighth grader on Monday morning. That was it. And I, I, lots of prompting and asking like, what does this look like? And um, 
you know, for our students that don't identify and feel super confident in math, we really need to think about ways to foster their identity, their agency and belonging um, in all of these ways to, to support them in what they're doing. And so this quote about, we don't teach math and SEL separately. We use SEL to teach math. We need to start and center the kids. That's going to be more open, more inclusive. It's going to like elevate that student role. As a former administrator, I went in and I watched teachers. And I go in now, I go into classrooms, which I love, and I so wish we could go into some more now and watch kids. That's where it's at, right? Like so much fun and engagement with the math. So what we really are hoping is that um, you can stay with us for the next bit of time, um, which is coming back for a webinar in September and then coming back in a community of practice um, over the next few months. I don't think that we have time for questions right now, but I will put my email in the chat and people can always reach out if there are questions afterwards about like what we can, um, how we're thinking about this involvement and Bernice and Tara were we can put our stuff on there so people can um, ask us some follow-up questions that way or put them in the chat. But I'm nervous that if I click on the chat, um, I'll lose the slides. <laughs> it's really storming. <laughs> um, as Jenny said earlier though, please do join our network if you're interested. Um, and the slide I want to get to, I'll come back to that one, is right here, which is that today is this webinar on August 24th. Um, the second webinar, Karina and Nathan are going to share stories about um, how they planned and used the lesson planning tool um, in their math resources. We're also going to be releasing a blog series. So there, Bernice has a blog out, Karina has a blog out um, that'll help you kind of get into that information. And then we want to have a real more informal process um, through October, November, December, thinking about a community of practice like how we can learn from one another and try the components that are within Stride 3 to develop um, really that tight connection between the mathematics and the social emotional piece that um, was really laid out earlier. So I'm going to go back and highlight a couple other things, sorry, not always in the best order, um, which are some of our upcoming events. So we do have that registration for September 14th. If you aren't as familiar with Student Achievement Partners, um, also please uh, think about joining an Eventbrite for one of our coffee and conversations. Those are a little bit different than our webinar format. We talk, um, have a presentation for about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then we break out and talk and come back for questions. So there's much more um, interactivity there, which is similar to what we're hoping to do with the community of practice. Um, our next one is on decolonizing instruction, and we have a guest speaker coming in for that. So uh, always check on and look at the event brights there. Um, and additionally, we do uh, love feedback. Um, technical glitches aside today, apologies for that. Um, for those of you that complete the survey, um, you'll get a certificate for one hour of professional learning for those of you that are looking for that. and then. Um, that's also a good way to reach out and we can share emails and keep in contact. But um, please do that and let us know how we can share more or how we might even be able to tweak the community of practice moving forward, like what things you might be interested in talking about, uh, learning about together as we kind of move forward in this journey of um, developing students' social and emotional well being in the content of, of math over the course of this first semester. And join us again for um, those ones coming up. There's the bit.ly at the bottom so that you can get all signed up. <laughs>